Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good, thank you. Well, I'm excited that everyone is here. And um, I'm glad that everyone could figure out the format that we're using tonight. We had tried it last week doing it completely pre-recorded, but this week we've decided to try and do it a little bit different. And um, Burl Coburn is waiting in the waiting room and I am so excited. I hope you all know Burl. He's just a wonderful gentleman. And so he is here as well now. So we'll be getting ready to start in just a moment. Hi, Burl. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, Burl. That's wonderful. I'm so excited that you're here. I feel like the family is getting back together again after these long, uh, long months apart. Isn't that wonderful? It is, it is. We'll give everybody an extra minute or two to get logged in. And so we'll start in about two minutes. And yeah, here is our first slide here for everyone that you can just see. This is what tonight's topic is about. And we'll go from there in about another 90 seconds here. Give everybody a chance to log in. I'll ask everyone that um, has their video up that if you would please mute your video or excuse me, mute your audio. If you have not, then I will mute it for you so that we can um, keep our, um, keep it clear for everyone that's, um, for Fred to be talking tonight. It's nice to see you, Peggy. Ah, uh, it's so good to see you, Burl. It is wonderful. I'm excited about this. I wanna read the books that are on your bookshelf behind you though. Well, the church is going to come over and take a lot of them. I used to teach Sunday school back when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I have got a lot of books that I thought they might like for their library. That's great. That is a wonderful thing to do, to share the wealth of books. And it, speaking of books, <laughs> this is your humble friend telling you that the book that you have on, or have, that you had on North Russia? Yes. When, when I started not doing so well, and I got, it got put away, and I found it, and so I've been waiting to go back, to the time to come back down to Submarine to return your book. I have it. You you know. Now That's, you know I know where exactly it. where it's at. That's not a problem. So, so oh. I apologize, humbly. <laughs> oh, not a problem whatsoever. But well. Let's get about? started. And if anyone else is going to join us, then they will join us. If not, they can watch it on YouTube tomorrow. So good evening and welcome to the second installment of the Fall 2020 Lecture Series, The World Transformed 1945 to 1953. Tonight's topic is going to be about the end of the war in Europe, the huge humanitarian issues that were caused by the war and the falling apart of all the different governmental agencies around the world. And finally, the Nuremberg trials. We're so excited to see our old friends here and we are really excited to see anyone that is joining us for the first time. Um, the Silversides came to Muskegon in 1987. We have been here for 33 years. It is amazing at how long that we have actually been in Muskegon and we are proud for all of those years to continue to share our information with everyone. Tonight's program is being brought to you from a wonderful, wonderful um, foundation in, Muske in the Muskegon, West Michigan area. It is the Fred and Lorraine Birch Foundation. They are a couple from West Michigan who has brought their love of doing service in the community, whether it be in terms of personal service, whether it be at the local or the state level, they are so proud to bring this service to us. And they are their primary supporters for our lecture series this evening. Our second supporter this evening is Blue Lake Public Radio. And um, 
We are delighted to have Blue Lake as being part of our family here and being our proud media sponsor. Tonight's lecture is being brought to you by one of our museum favorites, Fred Johnson. And without, I don't think that Fred needs much more introduction than that, other than he is a professor of history at Hope College. He has served previously in the military and he holds his PhD from Kent State. So without further ado, I will let Fred take over. So welcome very much, Fred. Thanks, Peg. And good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm sharing my screen with you right now, and we'll go ahead and get started. Let me just say it's a pleasure to be with you. And like Peg pointed out, tonight's session deals with the end of the war, end of World War II in Europe, particularly focusing upon the refugee crisis at the end of the war, and also the the revelations of what American, British, and Russian soldiers found when they liberated some of the camps in, in Europe. Those camps where, of course, the terrible thing known as the Holocaust had been happening for such a long time. The chief architect of the chaos, the madness, the misery, the suffering that was imposed upon Europe was, of course, Adolf Hitler. He wasn't alone because he had as his henchman an accomplice in Benito Mussolini the fascist dictator of Italy. But unlike World War I, where the Germans could legitimately dispute the fact that they had been forced to take the full blame of the war, there is little doubt that it was to this man and his Nazi accomplices that the world was shoved into a night of chaos, confusion, and unimaginable suffering, unlike anything the world had ever seen. If you take into account the fact that war no matter when it happens, it's always terrible. Somehow, the Nazis found a way of taking an inherently terrible thing and making it even more terrible. One of the things that stands out chiefly about the Nazi atrocities and the way they conducted war, what they, or what they called war, although many other people would just call it inhumanity, was the anti-Semitism that drove so much of Nazi ideology Nazi war making, Nazi strategy, and just Nazi behavior. These pictures are from the time of the incident known as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass that occurred in November 1938. If you'll notice in the foreground, there's a man and a woman, and they don't appear to be bothered at all by the destruction that they've seen. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, was a night where German citizens, Nazis, Police just stood by as Nazi shops, or rather as Jewish shops, synagogues, and homes were bombed, burned, vandalized, and basically the citizens, these German citizens, I think sometimes we forget that these Jewish citizens were also German citizens. They were completely at the mercy of the people who were ransacking their homes and their livelihoods. And it was a grim foreshadowing of the things that were to come and producing those millions of people who would end up being refugees, victims, being chased across the continent by one army or another. November 1938, as I mentioned, was a night called Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass. Here's a brief video describing the 75th Mark the 75 years marking since the beginning of the Holocaust, where the Germans take time to remember what happened. By 1938, Adolf Hitler had been in power for five years. He had imposed his Third Reich, a police state, and his own personality cult. He was called Führer. Nazi fascist doctrine was racist and anti-Semitic. On the 7th of November, German diplomat Ernst von Rath was assassinated by 17-year-old Herschel Greenspan, a German-born Polish Jew resident in Paris, whose family was forced out of Hitler's Germany. The assassination was seized as a pretext during the night from 9th to 10th November for coordinated attacks against Jews throughout Nazi Germany. They lost any rights. The attackers were paramilitary forces and non-Jewish civilians. The police stood by. This was called Kristallnacht, Night of Broken Glass. Jews were murdered in the rioting. Tens of thousands would be transported to concentration camps. Thousands of Jewish-owned stores, buildings, and hundreds of synagogues were destroyed. Cemeteries were profaned. 
The worst was in Berlin and the Austrian capital, Vienna. Racial persecution grew. Commemorating that 1938 beginning of the Holocaust, Chancellor Angela Merkel would stress that many people's failure to speak out had contributed to the breakdown of civilization. She said racism and anti-Semitism must never be given another chance in Germany and Europe. Now on Kristallnacht's 75th anniversary, Merkel called today's continuing need for police protection for Jewish institutions a sobering reality. The preparation for Hitler's extermination of the Jews, his final solution premise of an Aryan master race, included categorizing Jews and documenting them or stripping them of documents, businesses, possessions. It had begun with laws against interracial marriage, banning Jews from employment, from state hospitals, schools, libraries and parks, and it concluded in many death camps and gas chambers. It was the beginning of a very long, dismal period, not just in Germany, but for all of Europe. These pictures of Jewish citizens in, from different countries who were being rounded up, putting cattle cars, railway boxcars, and sent to their doom. Some to go to work camps where they would be worked to death, some who would be experimented upon, some who would be sent straight to the gas chambers and cremated. A Jewish author, Herman Wouk, wrote a two-part novel, the first part being entitled The Winds of War. And in the, in the sequel to this, very, very well-written, engaging story, sweeping epic of World War II. The second part is entitled The Winds of Weather, War and Remembrance. And in the forward of that, that second book, I remember when I first read it, Herman Wouk asked a question about those Jews who stayed in Europe and particularly those who stayed in Germany after Hitler came to power. And he wanted to know why. Why didn't they leave when it became clearly apparent that Hitler was intent on doing exactly what he said, that the Nazi regime was not just hostile, but extremely hostile and going to strip them of their citizenship, strip them of their dignity, if possible, strip them of their, strip them of their humanity, their very lives. He wanted to know why didn't they leave when they saw before their very eyes what was going on and what was likely to happen. And the phrase that he used in the forward in the War and Remembrance was something that I never forgot. He said that collectively, the Jews in Germany and the world at large basically engaged in something called the will to not believe. They simply could not bring themselves to believe that even a, liter e even a leader like Hitler, even a thug like him, even someone as, as, as unrefined, as thuggish, as blatantly hostile as Adolf Hitler and his accomplices, accomplices, they could not bring themselves to believe that he would actually go through with what he had been talking about. Do you actually implement the plans that they had been discussing for so long? They thought it was just campaign rhetoric, campaign propaganda to get into power and then consolidate power. But what they eventually find out was that he was all too serious. And by the time they discovered he was too serious, it was too late. So they waited too long, many of them did, and they became the victims of hate. A chief architect of that hate was a man named Reinhard Heydrich. Reinhard Heydrich, if there ever was a person who'd ever lived, who could have been said to be a demon in human form, it was Reinhard Heydrich. He was said to be the perfect Nazi. He had a high, he had a, a what they call a Roman nose, a high forehead, blonde hair, he was tall, he was lean, he was strong. He seemed to fit everything that according to Aryan ideology, you would want in a perfect German, a perfect blonde haired, blue eyed Aryan, a member of the master race. It fell to Reinhard Heydrich in early 1942. They met at a small villa, a small villa called, in a place called Wannsee, where after Hitler gave his order for something called the final solution, the elimination of the European Jew, it was here at this conference in Wannsee where Reinhard Heydrich sat down with other Nazis to plan the details of how they would round people up, send them to the concentration camps, and then selectively and surgically eliminate Jews 
from one country at a time until there were no more Jews left in Europe. I cannot think of a more diabolical reason for people to gather and a more insane goal. But yes, they really did meet there to sit down and seriously discuss this hellish objective to get rid of what eventually ended up being, as far as we know, six million people. Of course, the war did not go well for the Nazis, and that much was seen by December, rather June 6, 1944, D-Day, Operation Overlord. I read some accounts they called it Overlord, the, liber the liberation of, of not France, but the liberation of Europe. The first time I saw that, I thought, that is a massive undertaking to liberate an entire continent. But that is exactly what the world had to do to get rid of the infestation called Nazism. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, before American paratroops did their job that day, here's General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who basically was the brains and the administrative planner for Overlord, the, the landing in Normandy, giving some encouragement, some direction, some final encouragement before these guys take off to do their jobs. The landing beaches at Normandy were Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword, a combination of British, American, and Canadian landing forces. The landing, of course, was contested because the beachhead had been getting built up and prepared by one of Germany's best, Field Marshal Irvin Rommel. He had been working on the, the, the possibility for an amphibious invasion for about two years. So when they landed, it was fierce, fierce, fierce resistance. But finally, they were able to establish a beachhead and work their way in. At some point in 1943, and as 1943 turned into 1944, Russian and American troops came upon the secret that would cause the world to have just an unbelievable reaction. People's jaws would drop. They could not imagine what they had seen. I told my students at Hope College that there was nothing in the experience of, let's say, young men from Muskegon, from Holland, Zeeland, Grand Rapids, Borculo, any small town in West Michigan, nothing in their entire growing up and preparation for adult life prepared them for what they saw once they came upon these camps and encountered the people who had been living under Nazi cruelty. Open it up, sir. Stand back. Give us some room here. Stand back. Boys, these people need care. Give them water and any spare rations you might have. Grab me some blankets, quick. Sure. Uh -huh. Dick? Thank you. 
Can you believe this place? I sent the guards left this morning, sir. They burned some of the hot spurs, making the gefangenen immer noch drinnen. The prisoners still in them, sir. Alive. Some of the prisoners are trying to stop. Sie wurden getötet. Some of them were killed. Getötet, getötet, getötet. Die, 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 die Wachen hatten nicht genug. They didn't have enough ammo for all the prisoners. So. Bitte, so viele sie kommen. They killed as many as they could. Und, und um, dann verließen sie einfach das Lager. So they left the camp. Schlossen das Tor hinter sich und gingen Richtung Süden. Headed south. One in town must have told them we were coming. I think so. You ask him uh, what kind of camp this is? Um, what, uh, why are they here? This does here. This does here. This does here. Arbeitslager für, 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 für Unerwünschte, wirklich. He says it's a work camp for uh, Unerwünschte. I'm not sure what the word means, sir. Uh, unwanted, slight, maybe. Criminals? You know, when you consider what those men, those young men, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, saw in liberating those camps, it is absolutely no longer a mystery why these veterans from World War II came home and for decades they would not talk about what they had seen. Warfare would have been hard enough, but then to see that, those victims, then come the refugees, yeah. I don't think we're well, sir. Eventually, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander at SHAEF, S-H-A-E-F, Supreme Headquarters, Allied European Forces, at the camp of Buchenwald, one of the death camps. There were concentration camps, and then there were death camps. And the death camps were exactly what they meant. Their only job, their only purpose for existing was to kill people in an assembly line fashion, industrialized murder, and eventually, General Eisenhower visited a sub-camp or an adjunct camp, an additional camp near Buchenwald called Ordruf. And as he was going through, General Eisenhower, quite frankly, could not believe what his eyes were seeing. Here in this image, you see General George S. Patton, the famous tank commander on the far left, and then over Eisenhower's right, just right behind Eisenhower's right shoulder, General Omar Nelson Bradley, who was called a soldier's soldier, and they're basically con conferring about what their eyes are telling them and trying to decide still if it was real. In this image right here, you see some of the prisoners who are showing how some of the torture techniques that were used against them. And again, there's Patton, Bradley, and Eisenhower. So when they got there and the revelations started coming through, and then Eisenhower started, one, started asking around if anybody in the surrounding villages and towns knew what was going on. Eisenhower, who was known to be something of a short-tempered individual anyway, lost his patience. In the meantime, though, what he did was that he wrote a letter to General George C. Marshall, pictured on the right. Now, George Marshall at the time was the, chi was the chief Army Chief of Staff back in Washington, D.C. Essentially, he was Eisenhower's boss. And when Marshall, rather, when Eisenhower wrote Marshall, he just brought him up to date on how things have been going since the invasion. But then he got to this letter right here. And in paragraph two, he said, 
On a recent tour of the Ford area and first and third armies, I stopped momentarily at the salt mines to take a look at the German treasure. There's a lot of it. But the most interesting, although horrible sight that I encountered during the trip was a visit to a German internment camp near Gotha. The things I saw beggar description. In other words, you can't even imagine this. I, it's, they, they were so horrible, I don't have the words to describe them. He said, while I was touring the camp, I encountered three men who had been inmates and one by ruse or another had made their escape. I interviewed them through an interpreter. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. Fellow scholars, I must say that for a man who had dedicated his life to the military and who had seen war on more than one occasion, for Eisenhower to say that he had seen something that, that left him essentially sick, that is saying quite a bit. He, go to, he goes on to say, in one room where they were piled up, 20 or 30 naked men killed by starvation, George Patton, that is George Patton, the one who had the nickname Old Blood and Guts, the tough guy, the tank commander, he said George Patton would not even enter. He said he would get sick if he did. As I made to visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say this slowly. He said, I made the visit deliberately, deliberately in order to give to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there is developing a tendency to charge these allegations as merely pr to propaganda. Already in 1944, 1945, Eisenhower was predicting that these stories, what he was seeing was so unbelievable, somebody might be tempted to say he just made the stuff up. And clearly he did not. It was the tip of the iceberg. Eventually, as more and more bodies were found, Eisenhower and other American commanders gave the order for German citizens in villages and towns to, to be brought into the concentration camps where they were forced to look directly upon what had been happening in their midst. Many of them, of course, said they had no idea what was going on. Many American officers and commanders did not believe them. Folk were forced to look anyway. The looks of shock, horror on their faces speak for themselves. And then they were given the doubly grim task of helping to bury the bodies, the dead of whom they knew nothing about. As the war was winding down and it became very apparent that in addition to all the fancy, the, the sweeping strategy and the tactics of D-Day and rushing to liberate Paris and freeing the continent from the grip of Nazi domination. It, people had to wrap their mind around the fact that in addition to the usual conventional warfare, which was always bad enough, now there's this. People didn't even have a name for what had happened here under the heading of war. But somehow or another, this wasn't war. This was extra than war. This was something different than war. This was more horrible than war, as if anything other than war could be more horrible, but somehow in World War II, humanity found a way of achieving that. So graves were dug, bodies were buried. The suffering had to be cared for. The liberation of the camps co continued. Please bear with me as I read. The end of World War II brought in its wake the largest population movements in European history. Now that's what we're talking about, the refugees. Millions of Germans fled or were expelled from Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe. Hundreds of thousands of Jews, survivors of the genocide perpetrated by the Nazis, sought secure homes beyond their native lands. That is, many Jews, hundreds of thousands, millions of Jews left Europe once and for all to go to Palestine with the future to help establish the future state of Israel. And, uh, and other refugees from every country in Eastern Europe rushed to escape from the newly installed communist regimes because after all, well, the Americans, the British and the Canadians were pushing from west to east, from Normandy toward Berlin. The Russians were coming from Leningrad and Stalingrad from east to west also heading toward Berlin. Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union 
to put to put it mildly, toward the end of toward the end of World War II, the Russian people, the Red Army, they were in a furious rage, because on June 22, 1941, when the Nazis invaded Soviet Russia, what happened in the months and years afterward? Again, beggar the imagination. Like to borrow General Eisenhower's words, the Nazis savaged the Russian people. And for two, two and a half, three years, the Russians were basically fighting on their own while they waited for the British and the Americans and the Canadians to provide the second front that Stalin had always been asking for to get some relief on the Eastern front. Finally, it came. But then, of course, Stalin and the Russians helped themselves by defeating the Nazis at Stalingrad in February 1943. After that, the offensive war of the Germans in Russia ended. And from that point forward until the end of the war, they were fighting defensive land conflict. Even before the end of the war, the greater part of the German population of East Prussia had fled westwards, although thousands drowned en route in overloaded ships that sank in the Baltic Sea. In the city of Königsberg, annexed by the USSR, the Soviet Union, the food supply broke down completely in 1945. If you can imagine the fear of people trying to get beyond the Russians who are going to abuse them and torture them, just like the German troops had abused and tortured the Russian people. Then there's the fear, there's the terror, trying to, trying to escape the grip of communism. And then there's hunger as well. It couldn't have been more miserable. People were reduced to eating offal, and human flesh was offered for sale as fried meatballs. Seven centuries of German civilization in the city that had nurtured philosophers like Immanuel Kant and Johann Gottfried von Herder thus ended in cannibalism. By 1949, nearly all the surviving Germans in the region had been nearly driven out. In Poland, German-owned farms and houses. Let me go back up one. In Poland, German farms and houses were handed over to Poles. Germans were rounded up by militias and put in camps before being removed from the country. It was Victor's justice by the Poles upon the Germans, who in August 22nd, 1939, in an agreement with the Soviet Union, the Nazis basically told the Russians that when they, when they started the war, that they could have, the Russians could have the Eastern half of Poland, the Germans wanted the Western half of Poland. From 1939 to 1945, Poland ceased to exist as a geographic reality. Furthermore, in Poland, they were rounded up by militias and put in camps before being removed from the country in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was a country that came into being after World War I with the merging of the Slovak and Czech Republic. There, more than 2.2 million Germans were expelled and property was expropriated. It wasn't until July 1946 that 14,400 people a day were being dumped over the frontier. About three quarters of them went to, to the American occupation, American occupation zone of Germany and most of the remainder went to the Soviet zone. 60,000 Germans fled from Hungary before the end of the war, some traveling by boat of the Danube. By the end of the war, the Hungarian government ordered the German population to leave en masse. Most of them were sent to Germany, but from some villages, the entire adult population was deported to labor camps in the Donetsk Basin of the Soviet Union. What you've got here operating at the end of World War II is a massive refugee crisis. And that's just in Eastern Europe. This doesn't even begin to mention what's happening in Western Europe, in Germany itself, in Britain, in France, where people, because of bombings and the movement of the Allied forces and the battles against the Germans, they've been moving across the landscape. People can't find their parents, can't find their loved ones, can't find their spouses, some never to be found again. As far as Hungary goes, though, by the end of the expulsions, only about 200,000 Germans remain in Hungary. Once the full weight of what the Nazis had been doing began to register, and people slowly came to realize that they weren't imagining what they were seeing, the place that was chosen to have what became known as the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials was the same place where in the years before the war, the Nazis had gathered for their grand stages of power and parades and celebration and mystical glories of ancient Germany and borrowing some from Rome, borrowing some from the Teutonic Knights, but it was right there where the Germans had worked themselves, where the Nazis had worked themselves into a froth and had convinced themselves that 
War was inevitable to make war upon the world. It was there that the world chose to bring the perpetrators of war to justice. seething squash of Adolf Hitler's Nazi Congress comes to an end. This year they say there are 800,000 pairs of boots standing heel to heel, waiting for the Führer's final speech. When, after a detailed review of Nazi achievements, Hitler cries, my life's fight has not been in vain. so symbolically appropriate to bring the perpetrators of so many terrible crimes back to the place where they celebrated their coming war. There is a sense of historical consistency here. For example, at the end of World War I, the Germans surrendered to the French in a railway car in a place called Compiègne. In the summer of 1940, when the Germans invaded France, and the French surrendered, that railway car had been turned into a museum piece and was surrounded by chain links to set it off as a, to commemorate the victory of France over Germany in World War I. Adolf Hitler went right back to that same railway car, took the French senior commander into that railway car, and in 1940 had the French surrender to him, just like the Germans had surrendered to the French in World War I. Likewise, now the Allies brought the German high command, those who were still remaining, to Nuremberg to stand trial for their actions against the world. Again, bear with me as I read. August 8, 1945, Charter of the International Military Tribunal, or the IMT, announced at the London Conference. The International Military Tribunal was composed of judges from the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Leading Nazi officials were indicted and placed on trial in Nuremberg, Germany, under Article 6 of the IMT's charter for the following crimes. One, conspiracy to, to commit charges two, three, and four, which listed were crimes against peace, defined as participation in the planning and waging of war of aggression and violation of numerous international treaties. Three, war crimes, defined as violations of the internationally agreed upon rules of, for waging war. That means multiple violations of the Geneva Convention. And four, here's where this phrase Came. It wasn't the first time it was used, but it would come into more common usage in, in Nuremberg and certainly after the war. Crimes against humanity, namely murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war, or persecution on political, racial, or religious grounds and execution of or in con connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal whether or not in violation of domestic law of the country where perpetrated. The tribunal had its hands full, but it got to work. One, toward the end of World War II and during the war, one of the most evil of Hitler's henchmen was Hermann Goering. He had been a somewhat dashing character during World War I, achieved fame as an ace, that is, he, he shot down five aircraft and in air-to-air uh, -air combat and became an ace. He was Hitler's number two chief of the Luftwaffe. Many people considered him to be the most dangerous man in the Reich. But for all the evil that Hermann Goering could muster and cause, there was still someone even more evil than he was. And that was Heinrich Himmler, chief of the Gestapo and master of the Schutzstaffel. It was under Himmler's office that the massive network of concentration camps and death camps 
and the SS who, who provided the guards at the death camps and the concentration camps, they all reported to him. And if you're looking at the image of Himmler, or rather of Himmler on the left side, you'll notice that his cap right above the bill, it has a skull right in the center. In his black uniform, that skull was a symbol of something called the Waffen SS or the Waffen Schutzstaffel, a, a very elite unit, elite part of the SS. These guys were also part of the organization known, of the, known as the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen had one job and one job only. That was to round up men, women and children, usually elderly men, women and children, and to wipe them out. Their only job was to be a killing squad. Heinrich Himmler was the life force behind all of that. So of course, he was going to be standing trial. But just like, just like Hermann Goering did, you see there on the right, Hermann Goering was sentenced to die by hanging. But somehow, somebody, somebody smuggled into, his, into his, his prison cell cyanide tablet, and he took it and committed suicide. Likewise, Heinrich Himmler will also commit suicide. I have a brief clip on the Nuremberg executions and what happened to the bodies. <laughs> The International Military Tribunal, the IMT, convened in the ruined city of Nuremberg on the 20th of November 1945 to sit in judgment on the surviving leaders of Nazi Germany. The trial continued until the 1st of October 1946, when the judgments were handed down. Of the 24 defendants, 11 were sentenced to death by hanging. Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, the most senior German leader placed on trial, was somehow able to commit suicide the night before his execution using a vial of cyanide smuggled to him in his cell. This will be the subject of a different film in the future. The remaining 10 were all duly hanged by a special team of US Army executioners using two gallows constructed in the Nuremberg Palace of Justice's gymnasium. They were Wilhelm Keitel, Field Marshal, and former chief of the German Armed Forces. Joachim von Ribbentrop, Hitler's foreign minister. Dr. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, SS Obergruppenführer and chief of the Reich Main Security Office. Alfred Rosenberg, head of the Reich Ministry of the Occupied Eastern Territories and a major National Socialist theorist. Dr. Hans Frank, head of the General Government of Occupied Poland. Wilhelm Frick, Reich Minister of the Interior and then Governor of Occupied Czechoslovakia. Julius Streicher, publisher of the Nazi Party newspaper Der Stürmer. Fritz Zauko, General Plenipotentiary for Labor Deployment. Alfred Jodl, Colonel General and Chief of the Operations Staff of the Armed Forces High Command and Arta Zeiss Inquart, Reich Commissar of the Occupied Netherlands. The executions were botched, resulting in several cases of slow death by strangulation of up to 28 minutes instead of broken necks. And One of the major participants at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials was Associate Justice Robert H. Jackson. He was appointed by President Harry Truman to attend the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials because President Truman and the United States, coming out of World War II, the United States understood, and President Truman understood that America was no longer a second-rate power. America was now a superpower. But given what people had seen, given the revelations of the war crimes and the atrocities committed by the Nazis, and given the massive refugee problem, that the world was facing at the end of World War II, President Truman sent Justice Jackson to make sure that the world and history knew that the United States was A, involved in the prosecution of these war criminals, and B, that as we started moving toward the post-war world, the United States would no longer occupy what had been a traditional position in foreign policy, that is, generally isolationist, 
not really getting involved until the nation was specifically physically threatened. Now the United States as a world power, seeing the devastation that had happened as Hitler rose to power and nobody had done really anything to stop him, America, as far as President Truman was concerned, was going to, was going to be directly involved in constructing a post-war world. So just as many signs were in front of some of the concentration camps, the two words never again, so that the world, America, Europe, nobody would ever again have to endure the kind of suffering, destruction, atrocity, and breathtaking misery that had been caused by World War II. I would, that's pretty much all I have. I'll take some questions if you all have them. If anyone would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, ask a question, just shoot a chat back real fast and I'll unmute you. But um, I found it very intriguing. It always amazes me how so many people think that just because we declared victory, World War II, that it was over. It shaped people's lives for the next 20 years. Um, I've seen countless documentaries on the time and the effort that it took to rebuild Europe after the war and how many years it took and how long rationing left stayed in all of those countries for years to come. Yeah, rebuilding, you know, rebuilding the, the post-war world, just as Peg points out, it, it led to a whole lot of different things. Like, for example, the early on in Europe, an idea was had to establish something called the EEC, the European Economic Community, the European Economic Community, which became the European Union. The, the Europeans tried to establish basically a European form of the United States of America. They wanted to establish a United States of Europe. The idea being that if people are trading together and working together, cooperating together, and, and most of all, prospering together, then they'll be less inclined to make war upon each other. It kind of goes back to the Hobbesian model uh, articulated by Thomas Hobbes in, in, in the book that he published in 1651. He said that where there is no security, no stability, life ends up being solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So in the 20th century, not so much embracing Hobbes's model of an absolute single ruler or monarch, people decide that if we cooperate together and trade together and prosper together, we can avoid a situation where a world war reduces life to being solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Also, the, so much of what happened in the post-war world with the United Nations, and then NATO being established in 1949, and then also the to offset the other areas around the world, the post-war world and all the alliances, all the trade agreements, all the military connections, having troops posted in Germany and Okinawa everywhere, that didn't happen by accident. It all was designed to prevent another conflagration like World War II happening ever again. Such was the nature of that conflict that people understood we simply could not afford to do that ever again. Um, <clears throat> Tom Peoples has a question. Let me um, unmute him so that he can ask you it. Tom, you are unmuted now. Or I've asked you to unmute. There you go. Okay, there I'm there. Okay, uh, Dr. Johnson, how did the uh, uh, Allies establish or start to establish the reconstruction of the German society and government? I imagine there were a lot of people, as you said, were migrating out of Germany, but there certainly were a lot of people still left in the towns and cities. And I'm thinking about setting up uh, municipalities and uh, newspapers and uh, just a, a whole structure of government after. Uh, that devastation, uh, but we were really responsible for putting that uh, that whole territory back on its feet. How did that uh, get accomplished and what was the process there? Yes, we were. In some ways, it kind of reflected what happened in Japan when General MacArthur was established as military governor. Now, you'll know that uh, in Germany was divided into, into several sectors, a Soviet zone, a French zone, a British zone, and an American zone. And while that was agreed upon before the war ended, what happened as the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States started to cool off and start taking on more and more the characteristics of a Cold War, it then became even all the more important 
to inject Western ideals and Western market capitalism into West Germany, that way tying the West German economy and society and culture into the larger European, Western European economy and culture and the North Atlantic, meaning Canada and the United States. So that was a major step forward. And that was, that's part, part of what happened in 1947 when the Congress passed the legislation known as the Marshall Plan. The, the refugee crisis, even by 1947, was still so acute that there was a great worry, in this country at least, that people who were desperate, homeless, cold, might decide, might be seduced by, by communism. So this massive aid package was designed to bring some immediate material relief because, again, I don't want to downplay the level of destruction that had been visited upon Western Europe. It had been massive. Don't forget that the Allied bombing campaign had been going on since about 1941 all the way to 1945. Toward the end, toward the end of World War II, the Americans and the British combined, it, it, depending upon the day of the, the day in the air raid, they either, had, they either had air superiority, most of the time they had air supremacy. So they were, they were able to fly bomber missions pretty much unopposed toward the end. Those cities that had been destroyed, those towns that had been destroyed, they had to be rebuilt, infrastructure rebuilt, and people put to work. And you had, it for a very short period of time, this was kind of a controversial thing. Right at the end of the war, if you're looking around for people to be in charge of government, you need people who have been in government before. In other words, those with experience, who know how to coordinate things, run things, set up you know, municipalities. Well, a lot of those people had been members of a Nazi regime. So they wouldn't have been the, the emotionally the best pick, but they were the ones that had the experience. So some compromises were made. And then again, as the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union became more rigid, became more standoffish, the, the ideological environment moved the Americans to inject more of those market ideals and have an impact in, in writing the West German constitution, which had a lot of ideals that would be uh, amenable to the American constitution to bring West Germany well into the Western orbit. So it, was, it took a, it was a real heavy, big lift. Part of it was economic, part of it was, eco part of it was economic, a large part of it economic, a good part of it ideological, a good part of literally rebuilding the government philosophically, and then just getting people in-house and getting that, getting that entire nation up and running since it appeared that there was gonna be a long standoff with the Soviet Union, which of course did happen. And the proof was in the pudding in 1947-48. I think I, in, the, in the introduction to the series, I mentioned that the Berlin Airlift was proof of how the relationship had broken down between East and West when the Russians closed off East Germany and then closed off West Berlin as well. And the Americans and British were forced to, forced to fly supplies, clothing, food, fuel oil into West, Ger West Berlin for a whole year. Thank you very much. Appreciate the response. It's very, very good. Sure, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, I would like to thank Professor Johnson for giving us a very enlightening talk this evening. And we look forward to having you here next week and Monday evening at the same time. If any of your friends or family have missed this, it'll be up on YouTube tomorrow after tomorrow morning, late tomorrow morning, and they'll be able to watch it, not in real time, not be able to ask the questions, but <clears throat> excuse me, but they'll be able to watch the wonderful information that has been provided here this evening. I look forward to seeing you all next week when we move on to Asia and start talking about everything that's going on at the end of the war there as well. Thanks for the thumbs up, Tom. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been delightful. I'm hoping we'll be all get together again real soon in person. See you next week. Take bye care. Bye-bye.
Freddie.